Have you ever been wandering around Skyrim, just going from location to location as you normally would in an expansive open world? When you see a lone blue clad pine cone looking wizard, your curiosity gets the better of you. You go over there and they say unto you the following. If you know any true sons and daughters of Skyrim, tell them to head to Windhelm. Ulfric Stormcloak wants to see them. Well, I'm not one to personally take things literally, but I can't say the same for Professor Blob. <laughs> I can't say the same for Professor Blobblestein. Uh, I may have taken things too far with this character. Despite how Skyrim foists quests on your journal without your input, and no way to opt out, too bad. Because that quest to join the Stormcloak Rebellion is going to be there forever. I mean, unless you join or eradicate them on the side of the Imperials. It's for this reason that Brynjolf is the most irritating quest-giving NPC in the history of video games. You'll be playing a lawful good paladin when he approaches you to join the Thieves Guild, with no way of reporting or destroying them. You'll have a squeaky clean record, play every card right, but your light-faring ways will forever be tainted with the knowledge that this appropriately ginger Scotsman recruits for the Thieves Guild and you can do nothing about it. But what if you could do something about it? Not about Brynjolf, but about what the Stormcloak said. Or maybe both, that's fine too. This got me thinking. Wouldn't it be fun to get the sons and daughters of Skyrim and have them fight Ulfric's civil war? In Riverwood, we have Frodnar and Dorothy. They luckily come with a sidekick, which is really fortunate considering children in Skyrim will not fight back by default. A tale older than time. In the meantime, onwards to Whiterun, we encounter Miller Valentina. Did you know there are some fruits that actually grow- Didn't ask, plus don't care. We also recruit Lucia. She asks for a coin, but obviously giving her a job is much better than charity. She works for Professor Blobblestein now. Up at the Cloud District, we find the Jarl's children. Dangi, Frothar, and Nelkia. Speechless at the opportunity to serve Professor Blobblestein. What an opportunity. I travel to Riften where there's an army factory full of recruits. God, that's dark. But Professor Blobblestein himself identifies as an 11-year-old orphan, so it's fine. Inside, we find Grillard telling the kiddies they will never be adopted. Right before we walk in and adopt them for Ulfric's army, I give Grillard a goblin height shoulder charge and recruit Samuel, Francois Beaufort, Hraw, and Runa Fairshield. I also recruit Grillard because we will probably need a caretaker being that Professor Blobblestein identifies as an 11-year-old orphan. This disgusts Runa. <laughs> I need to equip them with gear, but because I'm an 11 year old, I have no money. So what money I do have I use to buy materials to work the forge, with my little kitty arms. I also partake of the age old method of moving items out of the line of sight of the NPC who owns them, but I managed to stuff even this up, resulting in Professor Blobblestein being chased by Yorl and Greymane, which also means he wishes to exterminate the children. Not a good start, Professor. Not a good start at all. Obviously running away all the time is a less than optimal approach to Skyrim, so I purchased the Courage spell from Farangar, who thinks I'd do well at the major college, only to find upon testing in a real world scenario that courage does not work on NPCs flagged as children in Skyrim. But here's the best thing about Skyrim. You can do just about anything you want with modding. Want to fly a Dwemer ship in the overworld to relive the Final Fantasy glory days? Check. Want more spells for your destruction repertoire? Check. Want something perhaps, perhaps darker? More sinister? Well, I don't, so for now I'm going to be settling with this mod right here. This supplies some fixes for children specifically as companions, which they appear to be made for, considering they have voice lines. With the army geared up and all the pieces in place, it's now time to test their mettle. Amran and his wife very awkwardly squabble in the street. Fortunately for them, though, Amran can tell that mercenary work will suit our wide-eyed professor, so we accept this quest to find his family sword. We also walk into this absolute reprobate. Do you get to the Cloud District very often? Oh, what am I saying? Of course you don't. We have been to the Cloud District and Nazim hasn't been to the cleaners, so I have SEAL Team Kindergarten show him the way. Unfortunately, Professor Blob and Flibble doesn't above the law in the same way that our army does, showcased by how they unlife Nazim's partner in front of the guards. Anyway, the lives are only worth 40 gold, so we pay up and make our way over to these two, Braith and Lars Battleborn. We recruit them in the hopes that instead of bullying one another, they can now bully our enemies. I acknowledge that the Stormcloak who said Ulfric wants to see any true sons and daughters of Skyrim is implying that they want Nords to fight for Skyrim. And I understand that Braith is Redguard, and some of the others are not Nords. But Professor Blobblestein doesn't discriminate. Besides, they all have the same potato face to me, so it's all fair game. I'm all potato gang. Ah, such a majestic sight watching our army mobilize over these hills. Professor Blobblestein, you've outdone yourself. How terrifying is Braith with a warhammer though? Taunting a literal crab as she smashes it to death, shoulder to shoulder with Grelod. My my. In the cavern where we will find Amran's family sword, Miller Valentina throws fists with a dog, and Lucia puts in work for that one gold that I may or may not donate her someday in the future. Mister, could you spare a coin? <laughs> <laughs> My father said 
I do try to give her an iron helmet, but her face skin melds with the iron and that creeps me out just a little bit too much. I hand the blade back to Amarin, who teaches us techniques we'll never need to use because the potato people are with us and our tests are a success. I have the troops stand outside of Windhelm to soak in what it means to be the future of Skyrim. Samuel in particular takes this very seriously. We enter the city and introduce ourselves to the locals, though we get some odd side glances. Is there something on my face? <laughs> Frothar starts to get excited, so we hurry on in to the Palace of the Kings. Ulfric Stormcloak looks down on our tiny 11-year-old professor frame and welcomes us into the army. He wanted to see the true sons and daughters of Skyrim and I've delivered him his wish. Now, however, he wants us to go to war for him. I speak to Galmar Stonefist, Ulfric's right-hand man. Although he and almost all the Nords can barely speak English, we're told to prove our worth to the rebellion before we can join. Samuel, uh, no, Francois? A potato takes this planning very seriously. So does, I think, Frothar, who just shoves me out of the way, catches eyes shot of my face, and then flees in fright. At the end of our planning, all the kids start to speak at once. Right, what? <laughs> we set off to show our commitment to the Stormcloak Rebellion. On a journey to the far north of Skyrim, the frozen wastes. With steel in our eyes, we know this will be a challenge. But there are greater challenges out there. This will be a breeze. We firing squad a wolf. Thraw executes a wolf. We camp overnight to stay the frigid cold. We traverse Todd Howard's unloaded ocean. We run through the snow. We stay the path. A hawker shoves his tusk right up our ass. The children dispatch the ice wraith without issue. Miller tries to tell me her life story, but she's a short-circuiting robot, so don't don't worry about that. <laughs> and I accept the blessing of the Serpent Stone, which is very important for later. It paralyzes and deals 25 points of damage per second to the target for 5 seconds. Very, very cool. Back at Windhelm, I start to take the Oath to join the Stormcloaks. But these two potatoes make things really awkward. Regardless, all hail the Stormcloaks, the true sons and daughters of Skyrim. <laughs> Silver plate. Galmar explains that we must meet up with Raylof and a group of Stormcloaks to retrieve the Jagged Crown and a Nord Barrow because it's an ancient symbol of royal legitimacy in Skyrim. And because the Stormcloaks perpetually live in the past. Like, they really think this relic, which we have to grave rub, by the way, will change anything. Imagine Raylof's surprise as the Potato Army arrives with Professor Blobblestein. Galmar is all like, that, That's his accent. And the first skirmish of the Sons and Daughters of the Sons and Daughters of Skyrim begins. Kindergarten Blobblestein destroys the Drugger Scourge, and I retrieve the Jagged Crown. But you know what? I like this crown. Forged from pure Nord Copium. I'm not sure I'm gonna give it to Ulfric. And this is where the Serpent Stone comes into play. I unequip the Jagged Crown, paralyze Raylof. He looks like he's screaming on the inside. We slip the Jagged Crown into his inventory, run our bald 11-year-old professor out of the crypt, return to Ulfric and tell him we have the Jagged Crown, and that he owes Galmar a drink. This completes the quest and causes his small Nordic brain a big confusion. You see, by mentioning a drink, his internal monologue turns from the Jagged Crown to other Nord matters such as Nye! But basically, the game doesn't check that the crown is in our inventory because it assumes you cannot dispose of it. And Nord Normally you can't. It cannot be dropped or sold. It can, for some reason, be reverse pickpocketed though. Anywho, we take Ulfric's axe to the Jarl of Whiterun as a symbol of war. And you'll notice our bald dome is still exposed. Don't worry about it yet though, we'll get to that soon. But for now, Jarl Ulfric won't accept Ulfric's axe until we complete some tasks for him. Tasks we are much suited for because of our cum. Suitable for someone of your cum. He wishes to discuss the ongoing hostilities like the rest of the great warriors with Farangar. But we escape and head to Riverwood. We find Raylof at the inn, obviously still traumatized by his last bout of paralysis. I uncaringly paralyze him again. And in his inventory is... Oh, how did that get there? And how didn't he notice? In any case, it doesn't matter. I wear the jagged crown now. Professor Blobblestein shall be king one day. The potato gang celebrate, two of which are too young to be patrons of the inn in the way that they are. But this matters not, because King Professor Blobblestein, with his weird pencil mustache, does as he pleases. You look worse than I feel. 
We ascend the mountain near Riverwood to take care of the task Yal Balgruff wanted to give us. Approach Bleak Falls Barrow. Watch on in absolute awe at how Dorothy terminates this grown man with a barrage of headbutts. Potato headbutts. Clear the chambers of the crypts with the power of school ground camaraderie. But my favorite part was when Braith turned to Professor Blorbelstein and said, It's Blorben time, and then proceeded to blob all over the Draugr who tried to sneak up behind her. They're all so bloodthirsty. It's fantastic. We get the stone tablet and take it back to Farangar at Whiterun, prompting Balgruff to ask the small man with an abnormally large head to go with his town guards to fight a dragon. You, like me, have probably seen this battle with the dragon before, probably hundreds of times, but let me tell you, you've not seen it like this. I return to Balgruff, tell him we've resolved the dragon thing. I become Thane of Whiterun Hold, and then paralyze him for reasons none other than I possess otherworldly powers outside of his understanding. Lydia tries to approach me, and I resolve that pretty quickly as well. Back in Windhelm, Ulfric and Galmar are having a DNM, while the kids in Grelod plot the invasion of Whiterun, and we make a run back to the place we were just made Thane of to sack and invade it. Now you might be thinking, best guest, how was this fair? In the base game, NPCs flagged as children are essential and can't lose a battle. And my rebuttal to this? Modding. 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 We assemble outside of Whiterun to prepare the invasion, but then Raylos starts going on about his oral hygiene or something, so I paralyze him and leave him convulsing on the battlefield, while our squad charge on into battle. It's a slaughterhouse. But it becomes really clear to me early on that Grelob the Kind is a kink in our armor. I do everything I can to keep her alive, such as using my own body as a shield, but she is at constant risk of death. And this makes sense because in the main game she's designed to die without any resistance. She basically has one HP. My solution to this is to send her away from the battle to deal with her later. She will have some use to us yet. The sons and daughters of Skyrim storm the walls. Our army makes it feel a lot more like an actual battle and less like four NPCs storming a hold with you. Very wholesome. The gang absolutely ends this white run guard, but I get a notification that a follower has died. In frustration, I backtrack, only to find that Grelot is stuck on some terrain and still alive, which means we suffered our first casualty. I scour the battle field and find one of our Skyrim potatoes on the floor. Frothar, one of Jarl Balgruf's sons. This enrages the other son, Nelkir, who while I'm blasting this barricade with my stringy frail professor arms, has phased through the obstacle and marches on with a vengeance. I call out to him. Uh, hello, Nelkir. <laughs> the battle continues like an argument in a Roblox RP lobby, and then Irilith throws out a slur. But honestly, that's racist, there's no need for this. And once Balgraf's own children kick the ever-loving ghost out of him, he surrenders. I'm ordered to report back to Ulfric at Windhelm. I arrive, watching him sleep. This guard walks in, isn't concerned at all by the absolute troglodyte standing over his Jarl's bed, and leaves. <laughs> oh, he just... <laughs> <laughs> I awake our lord by paralyzing and teleporting him off the bed. This spooks him. <gasps> Soon enough, we will march on solitude. He tells us true sons and daughters of Skyrim to find Galmar and Falkreath, and then goes back to sleep while Runa stands over him. And Dagny directly blames me for Frothar's death, but that's not my primary concern right now. My primary concern right now is in fact Grelod. I cannot have such a liability within the group, but conversely, we need adult supervision. And there's one way I can have her supervise us. Forever. I travel to Morthal and speak to a really dodgy back alley wizard who sells a literal child a black soul gem and the spell tome soul trap and asks absolutely no questions. No, hey kid, what you gonna do with those coincidentally purchased items? I have normal grand soul gems. Would you prefer one of those? Not specifically the one that can house a human soul. Hey, do you need that soul trap <laughs> spell? <laughs>
With that done, we meet Galmar, who's all like, Nargh! I steal a horse from the camp. No one seems to mind. And I meet Raylof, who tells us to sneak into the nearby Imperial camp. But no. Why sneak in when the Potat gang chase down Imperials in this manner? Needless to say, the fort goes down without much resistance. <laughs> We storm the basement and release the captive Stormcloak prisoners, who are now all redundant because the children are the upgrades. I'm ordered to report back to Ulfric at Windhelm. This time, I arrive to him standing in the corner of his chambers just looking at the wall. He refuses to lock eye contact with Professor Blobblestein. He fears Professor Blobblestein. He sends us to Markarth on a secret mission to convert the city, but as you may or may not know, Markarth is the toilet bowl of Skyrim. It is trash, and the people here are rodent-pilled. The poor woman who gets murdered as soon as we enter the city, I put on the butcher's block because because these people are probably going to eat her anyway. Absolute cockroaches. And I head to the Understone Keep to confront a Talos worshipper who has his sweet, sweet honeyed lips in the ear of the Jarl. We gather proof of this by sneaking into his chambers and finding the amulet of Talos. And hilariously enough, the guards are totally chill with like a dozen small children sneaking around other people's personal chambers. We present Rarak with the amulet and he tells us about an Imperial silver and weapon shipment that the Stormcloaks can intercept. We tell Galmar who's all like, nah. <laughs> And I steal a horse, this time gaining a bounty and upsetting the blacksmith at the camp, but not enough for him to do anything about it. Raylof gets right up in our face to tell me creepy stories on this spooky night, and the Blob Squad rush in on these poor Imperials just trying to enjoy nap time, and absolutely crush them with heavy attacks. What are you looking at? I paralyze Braith because she's getting too big for her boots, and watch as she cooks over the campfire. Galmar sends us to an encampment nearby to clear out the enemy, and this trip is wild. I cannot state this enough. Skyrim continuously provides, as it always does. I steal another horse, get another fine from I don't know who, and the blacksmith hurls insults at us again, and again does nothing about it. What are they gonna do, report me to the Stormcloaks? I am the Stormcloaks. We make our way through what should be a simple A to B and capture the flag journey, but perhaps it's best I just show you. Mission successful, so I go to report to Galmar, who immediately tries to kill me on approach. He goes full Mike Myers pursuit mode, at least until the children catch up and gank him in the swamps. Unfortunately, this leaves us no way to continue the quest to fight the Civil War. So I wait out in the swamps for seven days and seven nights without food or drink, and return to find Galmar has reflected on his multiple beatings and become a better man. Very good, Galmar. We're sent to track down an Imperial courier to intercept their communications. Fortunately, this courier fears the sons and daughters of Professor King Blobble Noble. We take the communications back to Galmar, who has a look at them and pretends he can read. Instead of doing anything conniving with the plans, he sends the baby army to another fort to take over, and I accidentally misclick paralysis on the Stormcloak who does a sick flip. Braith makes good use of her adoption greatsword. <laughs> Powered by Greloth the Kind's ensnared soul to make short work of her enemies. And that's another battle won. Back in Windhelm, Jarl Ulfric grants us a gift on behalf of all the sons and daughters of Skyrim. So I'm assuming all of my army spent some money to give me this normal leather armor. But he also grants me the Stormcloak Officer armor set, which I give to our most lethal warrior, Braith. Though unfortunately, this turns her arms and legs blue, probably because they're not programmed to wear armor. They're not programmed to be recruitable either, or fight at all, really. But modding. modding. Lucia sadly still wants a coin and is and is still very hungry. Back in Harfengard, just on the outskirts of our final battle in Solitude, Galmar appears to be disgruntled that he has to deal with our Potato Head gang, and I imagine simultaneously embarrassed that he got the shit kicked out of him. We're told to take another fort, and also for some reason, Belathor from the White Run General Trader is out here too. He has some beef with Professor Blimblesnorf, so I paralyze him before we hit the road. At this point, it should be clear the average run of the mill Imperial lookouts and forts are no match for our gang of preschoolers, who swarmed them with the strength of at least 10 full Fortnite lobbies, all resistance being given the Teletubby bye bye, and also given the wrath of Braith, who is at this point just an absolute juggernaut. Our next target is the Grand City of Solitude, so I steal a horse. Notice Galmar is furiously charging right at me and book it out of there. A speech by our Jarl and would-be King Ulfric is interrupted time and time again by Lucia becoming increasingly antsy for a single gold coin, which I vow to give her soon. But the speech goes on for far too long, so a little trick with him, or any NPC for that matter, is to nudge them to skip the dialogue. 
I throw a paralysis spell in for fun. The battle begins, and unfortunately, the grand climax of this civil war seems to lock out a number of followers from joining, which leaves us with only Runa, Fradnar, and Lucia, who is really putting in work for that single gold coin. This battle has always been nutty, with the exception the PlayStation 3 version, which had maybe six NPCs. But with Ulfric part of the battle ending Imperials like their programs in the Windows Task Manager, really, this is quite a straightforward and one-sided fight. The final battle takes place in the chambers in which General Tullius and Legate Ricker hang out and play Scrabble all day. Professor Blumblesnorbin's single contribution to this war is a paralysis spell on Tullius, so that Ulfric and the sons and daughters of Skyrim can alt F4 this poor, poor man. I am asked to deal the final blow with Ulfric's sword, but I thought it would be real funny to cast Fury on him instead and have everyone kill him at once. Unfortunately, Tullius didn't watch his cholesterol eating all those Nord sweet rolls, and his heart explodes right there on the spot. Ulfric says a final speech to the people of Skyrim, and by people of Skyrim I mean like 14 people in the courtyard. And if you ignore the fact that his rule is entirely built on a foundation of racial oppression and Nord Unga Bunga, this speech is actually quite eloquent. The old Mary Dominion may have defeated the Empire, but it has not defeated Skyrim! <laughs> And there we have it, we're done. For a time after this battle, the sons and daughters of Skyrim traveled the world, stamping out crime and injustices wherever they may have found it. But words rang inside Professor Blobble Blobble's head. Stories of how Ulfric tore High King Torig apart with his voice. That's totally radical. And while Ulfric did Nord things, Blobin Flobin studied the voice. While Galmar sat in his castle doing Nord Unga Bunga, Blobble Splobin studied the voice. And while the Stormcloaks were oppressing the Dark Elves and the Argonians, Blobble Orpel studied the voice. And while Ulfric sat there in his throne, we thought to ourselves, now I want to sit in the throne. Thank you. Divines, bless your kind heart.